Well, you, uh, you sound great tonight. I think you did bless the Lord. Together, let's ascend the mountain of the Lord. Amen? Hey, listen, we're halfway up the hill. We're halfway up the hill. Hope you got your hiking boots on because we ain't got there yet. So tonight we got a special guest. And uh, Meredith and I have had the pleasure of having Foy Bellier and his son join us last night. He's going to be with us tonight. His sons that rock the universe, he don't know what he's missing. I said, he don't know what he's missing. Well, someone once said that preaching was theology coming through a man on fire. You ready to get lit? <laughs> so, uh, listen. I started reading his book here, The Five Stones. I read a lot of books about Jesus and a lot of books about his church. And there's a lot of good books. Let me tell you something about this book. This book has had a lot, since I started reading it this week, there's been a lot of these moments. Hey, Meredith, listen to this. There's been a lot of those. Just a, just a fresh perspective, you know? New eyes to see Jesus. New eyes to see the church. New eyes to see how you should be living for the Lord. And so I would uh, highly recommend that you grab a copy of this. There's going to be copies in the lobby before you leave if you'd like to grab a copy and maybe have them sign it or something. I'm sure I'd be happy to do so. Can we pray for Foy? Can we do that? Father, I thank you that in your sovereignty you saw fit to have this night happen, that you would send this man of God to this house to proclaim your word with accuracy and clarity and power. So Lord, we are asking that you would give him those gifts right now, that you let him speak powerfully, accurately, and clearly so that we might leave here thinking different and being different because we didn't meet with him, we met with you. That's our desire. We thank you for that. We praise you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Revolution, would you welcome Pastor Foy Bellier? Brother, thank you. All right, let's make sure my technology's on here. Sound crew, are we good? All right, amen. I have some deep timber, and I've been known to project, so we wanted to make sure we... We captured this tonight. Man, it is so good to be here with you all this evening. What a powerful move of God's Spirit already. As the prayer team was praying before you all arrived, uh, I just sensed the Father preparing us for uh, an encounter tonight. Is anyone ready for an encounter with God tonight? But not an encounter with me, not an encounter with Pastor Moses, but an encounter with a passionate pursuer of your soul who has spoken your name and called you to himself and filled you with his spirit and given you fresh perspective, a, f a new purpose, and has empowered you by his spirit. So tonight, we're going to lean into a couple of things. And I was praying about um, what I would share with you tonight. When Pastor Moses and I talked about this, I had a deep sense that God... Uh, wanted to do some equipping tonight with regard to spiritual warfare. And when I talk about spiritual warfare, sometimes people think about some really weird things. Uh, and rightfully so. Tonight we want to look into the Scriptures and understand that spiritual warfare is part of our calling. And we neglect it at our peril. And because we neglect it, because we're ill-informed, because we haven't accessed the weapons for the warfare that we're called to, we live less than God calls us to and has appointed us for. Is anybody ready to receive more from the Father tonight? I, I feel like I'm right at home. I really do. I feel like this is my church in South Florida. Um, the Leesburg is very special to me. It was my physical home 
uh, for a number of years. My mom and dad lived here for a number of years. I pastored a church in the local community. Uh, and it's just good to be back. All those wonderful memories. My dad's since gone home to, uh, to go and be with Jesus. You're still going to have to pray for me. I don't know if you've experienced grief with the loss of a parent, but every time I feel like I've turned the corner, I'll hear a song that he liked or smell the food that he liked. We got Publix fried chicken, Pastor Moses and I. <laughs> Uh, man, I'll tell you what, that's going to be on Jesus' dinner table, I'm pretty sure. That was my dad's favorite, man, so I ate a couple pieces for Pop today. Um, but before we get into this, before we move to the text tonight, um, just a little bit about me so you know, I mean, some of you already surfed the internet for like three hours researching me, and I commend you for that, Bereans, well done. Um, yeah, I'm a New Englander by birth. Uh, I, I Irish uh, by descent, so I love to sing and dance, and uh, I, I almost got undignified during that praise and worship segment. I wasn't sure if it was okay here, so I held myself in check. But Pastor Moses was getting undignified beside me, so maybe next time I'm going to join in with him there. So I served in the military. I was in the Marines for a number of years. So when we talk about war... And living as a warrior, that's part of my story. I pastored and planted, did uh, church revitalization projects. And in this season of my life, God's called me to be a spiritual father, an equipper of equippers. So rather than locating my ministry in one church, in one body of elders, which I have loved and I continue to do in my home church, where I'm just the old guy who sits in the back row. I keep my hair short on purpose because it's coming in white all the way around. I get to travel and hang with guys like Pastor Moses and Miss Meredith hosted us. What is it? Incredible spiritual fathers and mothers you all have in this congregation. Let's give the Lord a hand praise tonight. And it's, I love how Pastor Moses is looking to intentionally equip all of us to do the work of ministry. So tonight I'm going to equip all of us to do the work of ministry because the last time I checked... And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the ministry of reconciliation is not just for clergy persons, it's for every person who's been born again by the Spirit of God to affect the trajectory and the destiny of every person in your sphere of influence. Somebody needs to say amen right now. So, this place is about to go up in an inferno. I'm just going to give you a heads up right now. Uh, you better put your seatbelt on. Because it's going to happen. Now, before we move to the text about spiritual warfare, I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to touch on a couple of things. And since we're going old school tonight, and I love that, I didn't have to prepare 800 slides for you all to see, which I hate because I hate computers. They're the bane of my existence. It's a love-hate relationship. We're, we're going to go back and we're going to circle back around. Now, everyone who came in the front door should have gotten a piece of white paper. If you don't have a piece of white paper, would you raise your hand? I'm sure one of the ushers will get you one. You're going to need this because as a mentor and a spiritual father of mine once said, I'm going to say some stuff that you should take down. Because God's Spirit is going to use it, not because I said it, but because it's going to pop and he's going to give you some prophetic insight about how what we discuss from the Word is intended to equip you to do the work of ministry rather than expecting Moses and I to do it for you. I'm about to go to Medlin. Get ready. Okay? Now, oftentimes with my... And again, I, I, I got out of local church ministry... I'm going to be straight up with you because I was smoked. I was burned out. I planted churches, revitalized churches, developed leaders, numerous denominations. This is not to pat myself on the back. This is to tell you how stupid I was because I didn't, margin, I, I didn't leave enough room for margin in my life. And listen, don't, everything that glitters isn't gold, you all. You've got to pass by the good things to get to the God things. So tonight... I'm going to share a little bit of some of the stuff that God has birthed out of my journey 
of healing and restoration, which I was able to reach back and all of that wonderful training I got in college and seminary and from wonderful people who've poured into me over the last 30 years, you're going to receive the benefit of it tonight and I am delighted to be here because I am believing for miracles tonight. I'm believing that people are going to get activated in their gifts. I'm believing that there might be healing that's going to happen tonight when I invite you to come forward to pr for prayer. There might even be somebody who doesn't even know Jesus here tonight who needs to get right with the Master, not because they have to, but because their eyes have been opened to how beautiful and glorious He is and His heart for them. He wants you to come near. He has good gifts. He wants to give every person tonight within the sound of my voice. I am absolutely convinced of it. People have been praying and fasting and interceding in my network for what was going to happen tonight. And we're going to see breakthrough. Is anybody down for that? Okay, so if you've got your pen, I, I, I don't have time to do the justice to, to these tools that I'm giving you, but I have so much theology that I often look for practical ways to express it because it's too often times that guys like me get up here and tell you guys to go do stuff, but we don't give you tools to do it. So tonight, I'm going to give you some tools, capture these things, noodle on them, go back to the Scripture. Listen, y'all went to, for three hours on the Internet to Google me and see where I'm coming from. Let's go to the Scriptures and check this stuff out, y'all. Okay? Here we go. So, if you've got your pen or your pencil, I want to talk to you about how to share your faith story. Uh, the church, as a percentage of our culture, is in steep decline. Does anybody know this? And don't believe all those things you hear from George Barn about how six or eight people out of ten in our country are born-again Christians. You know that to not be the case even in your own circumstances. The real numbers are much smaller. The last ones that I've seen from reputable statisticians who study this stuff is like 8 or 9%. And it's shrinking as a percentage of the population. So until we get confident with how to share our stories, as God moves in our hearts to wage war, we're going to wage some war tonight, wage war for our friends and our family and our neighbors who live all around us, this stuff just isn't going to change. It's going to pick up speed. You want to know what the United States is going to look like in one generation? Look at Paris, France, or London, England. Unless God visits us with a, a mighty outpouring of His Spirit and renewal, and He ravishes the bride with his love and his bride in return pours themselves out with wholehearted affection to the one who has captured our attention, captured our affection, literally bought us back from the slave market of sin. Oh, my dear friends, we're going on a journey into the Father's heart tonight. Listen, everybody that you, that you talk to knows that this world is broken. This is, this is from my friends at No Place Left. Great gospel people who are committed to penetrating every community in our country with residential missionaries. Every single one of you is a residential missionary out here tonight. We don't pay people on the foreign field to preach the gospel. We preach the gospel with our lives and with our love. Everything is broken. We all know that. It's a great place to begin a conversation. An eight-year-old can draw this chart. No place left. Google it. You'll find it. Now, we know that that's not the way that it was, it's supposed to be. And that's because God created everything perfectly. We know that from the Scriptures, right? Right in the first pages. It was perfect. We had perfect fellowship with Him. But something happened. Sin, our first parents, it's not their fault exclusively. All of us have contributed to this, right? You're not a hostage to sin. You and I commit it in word and deed, and we need Jesus to rescue us from it. So because sin entered the world, death and the curse found us and corrupted everything. So that's why everything's broken. So how do we deal with the brokenness in our lives and in our families and around us? There's some significant ways that people try to do this. And this is intentionally structured like a bungee cord. Has anybody ever bungee jumped? 
It's crazy. You, well, let's just leave it like that, okay? So these things are things that we try to do, and they bungee us back into our brokenness, oftentimes more broken than we started. The first is distraction, leisure, sports, pursuit of pleasure, whatever it is. Whatever's distracting you from your purpose that God's given you will kill you if you give it opportunity to do so. Secondly, addictions. Addictions to booze, pills, drugs, food, porn, pride, anger, whatever your sin du jour is, it's constantly calling and whispering for you to come back around. And it will break you. It will kill you. Self-improvement. I have a friend of mine who calls it the best version of yourself. How do people do that? They push a lot of weights. They get a lot of schooling. They get a lot of cosmetic surgery. Does any of that change what's going on in here? No. None of it does. And the last one, and perhaps the worst one, is religion. Uh-oh, did he just say that? Yes, I did. You know what the difference between religion and gospel is? Religion tries to earn God's favor by what you and I attempt to do on his behalf. Gospel invites us into an understanding where we recognize that we have nothing to offer him but our brokenness and everything to gain. And he's waiting with his hand outstretched to give it to us because he loves us like crazy. So what do we do? How do we get out of this brokenness? Well, the scripture says the apostolic preaching of the, of the cross, the book of Acts, repent. That means not just to change your mind, but to literally change the direction of your life in a moment, which then leads to a series of moments where you continue to repent as you live your Christian life. Not a repentance unto salvation, that happens one time. But this repentance is where we say, God, I'm busted and broken. You are what I need. I'm going to receive Jesus as my Savior, which is what this is right here. We can't just tuck Jesus in our back pocket and live the life that we were living in our brokenness up here. It doesn't work that way, y'all. So if you're there tonight and Jesus is in your back pocket and you're miserable, there's a reason for that. It's out of Father's love He's beckoning you deeper into intimacy with himself. Take those idols out, drop them by the wayside, and run after Jesus as hard as you can. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap right now. Well, what are we repenting of? I mean, I have talked to people on airplanes who don't even know what the origin of Christmas or Easter is. My age. In New England, I've got three generations of people who haven't even been in a church. These are my people. And you know what? It's moving from the north to the south and from the metro centers in. Within one to two generations, everyone will look like New Englanders. Unless God does something as his people respond. Pastor Moses and I were just, we were on the verge of tears talking about our people in New England. Listen, Revolution Church, reach the people of Central Florida. Yes, you should. But you should pray for the Lord of the harvest to send people to my people that they might come to know him as well. Listen, well, you might say, well, we're a little church. Listen, this thing's being broadcast. Let's have some house churches. Let's have some cell churches. Let's beam this thing in, and let's go international, you all. I'm going to speak a prophetic word over you. There you go. Here's the story. Jesus comes down to rescue us from our sins. He does that at the cross. He ascends back into heaven where he sits enthroned beside the Father. The two of them pour the Spirit out onto the church, the very Spirit of God who gave Jesus insight in his earthly journey as to what he should do and where he should go and who he should heal now lives inside of you. Come on now! Is anybody excited about that? He raised Jesus' dead body to life and he's raised us from death unto life as well. Listen, if you think that you did anything to earn God's favor or you had anything to offer, may I burst your spiritual bubble right now and tell you you are quite misinformed. Look at that person next to you. That person's a disaster. Don't look at your wife right now or your husband. And you know what? So are you. 
It's the gospel. It's the glory of Christ by His Spirit transforming us from the inside out that we would burn with passion. Not with unholy and ungodly passions, but passions for Jesus and for His kingdom to come and for the mission to go forward and to see people be saved and built and leaders released into the harvest as we intentionally go to where they are. Listen, I don't know where this mistaken understand uh, that's being perpetuated in so many dying churches is where they think that people once came to the church in the 1950s and 60s and didn't have to be evangelized. I don't know any place where that actually ever happened. There were a lot of people who came to church for a lot of reasons, but there's been a great falling away, which gives us a great opportunity to testify to the reality of Jesus and a fresh outpouring of new wine in new wineskins like this. So I want to encourage you tonight to stay the course. You don't get to put the Eagle Globe and anchor on until after you get through boot camp. You and I are in the middle of a boot camp experience, but listen, your senior drill instructor isn't trying to destroy you or diminish you. He's equipping you so that you can hit the battlefield with valor and accomplishment. Does anybody believe that tonight? So what do we do Once we hear this story and we repent and receive Jesus, well, we're recovering God's best for us. It's the image of of God. All of us bear it. That's why the worst person in the world deserves to be honored and seen as treasured by God because they bear the echo of His image. Be careful about how you, how you treat your spouse or your neighbor or your child or your co-worker. They bear God's image and they ought to be honored. The church needs to be a place where people are honored and cared for and welcomed. And I love how you guys are living on mission. It makes me so happy to be here. I feel like I'm part of your family now. Because of what you guys did, because of your prayers and your ministry, my brother came to know Jesus after 40 years years of my mother praying. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap there. When God's love is present, when the life of Jesus is present, it attracts those whom God is drawing to Himself. And they might smell different and look different. And they might even get undignified in the worship service. So we're recovering the image of God as the scars of sin are being erased. I love that. It's like we're getting some Holy Ghost cosmetic surgery. Some of you, some of you all wish you were getting some cosmetic surgery. L- listen, you're, you're beautiful the way you are. Can I just say that? Papa loves you. And as we recover the image of God in our lives, there be, there's a passion. There's a passion that emerges. And we start to pursue God. And this is where the church gets it wrong, friends. You can be all in with this whole deal. Ready? We've worked all the way around the circle. But if you don't do this, and this is mission, if you're just going to chase God just to chase God, though the benefits will be wonderful, you're going to miss out on the purpose of your life. Yes, I, I, I know the Westminster Confession, and I know that The chief purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, and I believe that. But He's given us the ministry of reconciliation for a purpose, that we might take the beauty of Jesus back into the brokenness of the world. If you are not intentional about this, you will drift into complacency and stagnation, and your light will wink out. It's just a matter of time. So here, God has visited you with clear vision and passion to reach the unreached, to love the unlovely, unlovely, to come into a greater awareness of your destiny so that you might live with passion for the one who is passionate about you. Listen, I, I know the Bible says that Jesus was Jewish, but I like to think in my flesh that he might be Irish. No, I know that's not right. But God is passionate, and my people were passionate about a lot of good things and some other things that aren't so good. Particularly when chemicals are added. You've got to go back into the harvest. 
You who are fresh from the harvest, get equipped, get built up. But don't just keep going to Bible study after Bible study and getting fat at the Bible buffet. Get out there and do something for the Lord God Almighty. Not Listen to what I'm going to say. I'm going to qualify that. Not in your strength or you will flame out. You've got to let God's Spirit cause submission to rise up in your heart. Listen, the Muslims talk about submission. You know who talked about submission first? Jesus. I was praying for you all, and I felt like the Lord gave me a word for you uh, corporately. And it was something that was spoken into my life many years ago by a French theologian, and it's this, and you should write this down, some of you who need encouragement. Trust in the slow and steady work of God. Because even when things are not looking like anything's popping in the natural, there's things happening behind the scenes that are getting ready to manifest in God's time. So you've got to believe it in order to receive it. Just like the gospel. Our problem isn't that we expect too much from God. We expect too little from God. That's it. That's how you share your story. Boom, you're welcome. Now, the evil one wants to get in there and intersect in all of these places to keep you from doing that. We're going to touch on that later. He also wants to keep you from developing a way of life in Christ. And I have given my life to helping people to develop a way of life in Christ. When I ask people, when we, like, you know, this book, yeah, it's great. It's just kind of my story. I just kind of blundered into it by God's provision. Listen, when you talk to people and ask them, and they say, oh, I'm a Christian, what does that mean to them? Does that mean they go to church? Does that mean that they memorize Bible verses? Does that mean they go to uh, the, the local community soup kitchen? Now listen, all of those things are good, but that's not really what it's about. It's about having a love relationship with a king of the universe who then who lived a way of life, who wants to transfer his way of life onto you. So we need to have a way of life where we can follow Jesus in our every day. Yes. Not just on Sundays or in Awana on Wednesdays or at the Friday homeless shelter, though those things are important. How are you going to follow Jesus in the, at the salon? At the Publix? At the pub, if you're Irish? I'm sorry, we drink coffee here. At the coffee bar outside. Okay? I, get, I'm ho ho I might not get invited back after that. I don't know. So how do we do that? And the way that that happens is you have to boil all of this stuff down. Listen, we make Christianity way too complicated. Does anybody believe that here tonight? I remember growing up as a kid going, what am I supposed to do with all this stuff? How does this intersect my life? Memory has a lot of verses. I'm a good church boy. Well, I had a whole nother life behind the scenes because I was longing for identity and community and development. And I love my church where I grew up. They taught me the Bible and they did the best they could. But sometimes the best they could isn't enough. So I want to give you some tools tonight to take you higher. To take you higher. So... How do you develop a way of life? This is drawn from the book. I don't have time to go into it. I, we, I talked to Moses, and I felt prompted by the Spirit just to help seed this conversation. Now, I want to, in all humility, say this is not the way to do it. It's a way to do it. But you must have a way of encountering Jesus in your every day. And if you haven't constructed one, you won't have one. Did you catch that? I just connected the dots for you there. If you don't construct one, you won't have one. You'll be drifting aimlessly through your Christian life, feeling a lack of joy, a lack of purpose, and wondering when Jesus is going to come back and put all this mess in order. Does Jesus need to put this mess in order? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. But you know what? He's not going to do it until we do what we're appointed to do. Okay? Listen, I'm going to give you this one. This is a freebie too. My, pop, my spiritual papa told me this one many years ago, and it's always stuck with me. You ready? 
Get your pen ready. Here I go. Come on. Stick with me, y'all. We're just getting started here. They locked the doors when you all came in. Did you know that? God refuses to do those things he's called us to do. Somebody's got hit right between the eyes. God refuses to do, because he loves us, not because he's harsh. Don't listen to that whisper right now. God refuses to do the things for the refuses to do the things that he's called us to do, comma, and here comes the hope, here comes the gospel. He reserves for himself all of the things we cannot do. He reserves for himself all of the things we cannot do. Can you open anybody's heart for the gospel, friends? No, you cannot. Let the pressure off right now. But what you can and should be doing is looking for ways to share your story about how Jesus changed your life with your friends and your family, your neighbors, and even those turkeys at work. So, this way of life is influenced by St. Patrick and St. Benedict and the apostles and Jesus and faithful people who have followed the way of the cross down through the years. It's not new to me. I'm just presenting old stuff, fresh. And it's good. It's choice, and it's juicy, and it's satisfying to the soul, as the psalmist says. Okay? Key questions. You can't answer these questions unless you understand the foundation of where your Christian life comes from. Okay? What do you know about the kingdom of God? Some of you would say, if I put you on the spot, I'm not going to let the pressure off. I'm not going to call you out. Come on. I love you guys. Some of you would talk about the kingdom of heart being, kingdom of God being in your heart. Well, that's true, but that's not enough. It's not doing anything in your heart for all the people around you who are lost and perishing. That's a word the church needs to hear right now. Some of you would say, oh, it's when I die and go to heaven. And there's lots of people in the church who believe that as well. And that's true also, in part. The last time I read the Gospels, the Lord Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is at hand 2,000 years ago. Listen to where I'm about to go. I'm about to flip it on you. The kingdom of God is here now, but not in its completion. So if you believe that God's kingdom is here, that Jesus inaugurated it, and it's pulsating outward irresistibly, overcoming the dominions of darkness and the schemes of the adversary and destroying addictions and breaking shackles and chains, you're going to live differently than if it's about what's going on in your tiny little heart or what happens in the sweet by and by. Did that sound harsh? Okay, good. I get passionate. Sometimes people think I'm yelling at them. That's because I love you. Okay? The kingdom of God is here now. Believe it and live like it. If you believe the kingdom of God is here, you're going to ask God for miracles. You're going to expect him to do things. You're going to see the dead. You're going to look for the dead to come to life because that's the greatest miracle there is. When somebody puts their trust in Jesus and says no to their flesh and their idolatries, everything else is icing on the cake, y'all. The kingdom of God is here right now. Live like it is. Live like it is. The king is here. I love when Pastor Moses said, the king is here. And he is in the process. Tim Keller, one of my teachers, said, God is in the process of making everything wicked come untrue. Okay, I'm going to push back on your Christian ego here for a minute too, okay? Because it might be the only time I'm here. Probably the correct after this sermon. We'll see. (laughs) Your salvation is not the most important thing in God's mind. Did he just really say that? Yes, I did. Your little story is important to God, but it's not the most important thing that's galvanizing everything he does in heaven every day. He is renewing and restoring all things. That's what Revelation teaches us. 
Jesus will come, and at that time, when the kingdom of God is fulfilled, con- consummated, as the, th- as the theologians say it, everything wicked and evil and hurtful and harmful that destroys us will be obliterated in an instant. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. If you believe that's going to happen, it's a short step from that if you believe the kingdom of God is here and right now for us to pray with expectancy and say, God, would you visit more of kingdom future into kingdom present right now? And if I was in a Pentecostal church, I, this is the point where I'd go, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Let's move on. I'm getting, I'm getting hot up here. What? What are we to do? It's very simple. Great commandment, great commission. You ready? Love God. This cost me a lot of money to learn this. You're getting it for free tonight. You ready? Love God. Write that down. Oh, we know that, right? No, we don't. Love God, love other people, and make disciples. What does it mean to make disciples? It just means to teach other people to love God and love other people. Some of us are so busy trying to love other people in our flesh, we're not loving anybody at all. Ooh, that smarted. Listen, you can't love anybody, including yourself, until you learn to receive God's love for you first. Why don't we scale back the church calendar, now I might really be getting in trouble, I'm not sure, and rest on the bosom of the Father and hear his heart beat for you, rather than making 14 casseroles. There's a time for casseroles, but only after we've heard the heartbeat of God for us. Pastors are notorious for this. I coach and counsel hundreds of people, many of them clergy, and they're so busy doing the ministry. Pastor Moses, don't make me have this conversation with you, sir. We're so busy taking care of the needs of others that we're not taking care of our inner man first and our first congregation, which, light bulb, isn't you all. It's Miss Meredith and the kids. So listen, if Miss Meredith needs to be in the service, Somebody better be back there in the children's room helping out. You can say you love children's ministry all you want, but until you get your fanny back there, you don't really. That's right. That's right. I might be coming back after that one. I'm not sure. Okay. Great. Co- I think I just let the genie out of the bottle. Lord, bring him back. Bring him back, Lord. Great commandment, great commission. How do we make disciples? I was part of a national conversation with a denomination. I'm not going to give you all the details. And I'm glad you're here, ma'am. I'm glad you're here. So we let's let's circle back around. Jesus helper. Um, great, great commandment, great commission. So the way, that, the way that we do this is to just live life with other folks. We need community. And you need to pass on what God's given to you. It's really that simple. You don't have to have a D-men or an M-div. You just have to teach somebody who's younger in their walk with Christ what it means to follow Papa and to love him. All of you can do that. Amen? You can do that on the way to the soccer field with your kids. Husbands, and this is the evil one, uses this all the time. This is the way he attacks us. Fathers, grandfathers, husbands, newly married, boyfriends. That you can't lead your wife. You can't lead your family unless you do an hour of Bible study, sing 14 hymns, and do 30 minutes of prayer every night. No, you don't. Why don't you just share what God's doing in your life? Have a prayer, and and that's a great start. That's five minutes right there. Five minutes can turn into a whole lot in the kingdom economy, friends. You aren't in this by yourself. The Spirit of God lives within you and will empower you to resist the lie of the evil one and to walk into your destiny. All you have to do is say yes. How do we do this? The leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now, I grew up in a tradition where I learned a lot about the Word, And I love how this church is both richly focused on the word, 
proclaiming the gospel, but also desirous to be led by God's spirit. It's not an either or. The devil has separated the people of God, and it grieves me enormously. We have something to learn from people who love to experience and encounter Jesus in worship and in some of these other ways that are part of their distinctives. And they oftentimes have some things to learn from us in terms of rich, robust biblical teaching. It's a both and. It's beautiful. Jesus would call that the way Christianity should be. Can I get an amen? amen. So when I came to a point where I realized I didn't really know very much about the Holy Spirit. I grew up learning in the church that he was a Christ glorifier. He convicted the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he was the one responsible for opening sinners' hearts. That's all I knew. If that's all you knew tonight, if that's all you know tonight, maybe you didn't even know that much. If that's all you know, you need to read the Bible. God's Spirit is powerfully active. And we need to learn to listen to his voice and hone the gifts that he's given. And then operate, not for, to be spiritually puffed up and say, oh, I've got the gift of pastoral leadership, or I've got the gift of this, or whatever, but to serve the body of Christ. All spiritual gifts are given to bless others in the name of Jesus. That's a pompous pill right there. Okay? Well, when are we supposed to do this? In our daily lives. Okay? Rhythms of celebration, rhythms of worship, rhythms of a, a number, re, Sabbath rest. God's designed us for rhythms. And when you live out of rhythm, like most people in our culture who don't rest, who work seven days a week, 16 hours a day, you lose your wife, you lose your family, you lose your health, and eventually you lose your life, both spiritually and physically speaking. You need to learn a Jesus rhythm for your life, and there's ways to do that that are embedded in the Gospels. And I'd be delighted to talk to you more about that later. With whom are we supposed to do this Christian thing? With our family first. Faithful people down through the ages have recognized the fact that Deuteronomy 6, where the Jews were commanded to impress the precepts of God on their children, are intended for us as well. Not that we would observe Jewish ceremonial law, but that we would teach our kids how, what it looks like to follow Jesus and not farm them out to professionals on Sundays and Wednesdays and Friday nights. You can do this! Look at the person next to you and say, you can do this. Okay, now this time, like you actually mean it. And then you guys, get, you guys got this going on. Church is family. So there's people in the church who need family, who haven't had good experiences with family, and they need to be swept up into your Jesus story. Have them in. Your home, your safe place, is God's home and God's place. Your dinner table is God's dinner table. Listen, you're never going to invite your neighbors in until you start with your church members because you're feeling a little comfier with them. So start with your church members. Invite somebody in for some chow. Get to know them. Share your Jesus story. Do whatever it is that you do. Watch football. Drink triple macchiatos. I don't care. Where? Or towards what end? This is so we will go out into the harvest field. Do you remember that? back here to where it's rough, where it's broken. So, the evil one is going to attack you. The evil one's going to attack you here. He's going to want to get you bogged down in doctrinal divisions and distractions. Foolish controversies is what Paul calls them. He's going to bog you down here because you're going to want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because somebody did something weird that you didn't really like and made you uncomfortable. Don't do that. I have a friend of mine who says, embrace the unruly. Listen, God's unruly. He is. Why do we keep asking him to do the same thing again and again and again when you look in the scriptures and he never does the same thing twice? That sounds like a ploy from the evil one that we've bought wholesale. I reject that out of hand right now. He's going to try to keep you from having a rhythm that's going to bring you into greater spiritual, physical, and emotional health. He's going to disrupt what's going on in your family unit, keep you from sharing the scripture with one another, singing in the car, whatever it is that you do in your rhythm. There will be all kinds of interruptions. Sweep them aside, push on, complete the mission, soldier. 
He's going to want to divide church families. He does it all the time. Many of us, if not all of us in here, have experienced that. At this point in time, if I've got Jesus in common with somebody, if they love him and they're following him in the gospel, I don't care about their secondary distinctives and their personal preferences. And I'll tell them that to their face, then I will hug them and we will pray together. And that's one of the things I love about your pastor. And he's going to want you to continue. He's going to interrupt you as you try to take these first baby steps in being missional in your community. Listen, don't show up at the church to go out and hold prayer placards, as important as that is. Your first step is meeting your neighbors. Everybody on that piece of paper, draw a tic-tac-toe outline, please. Put your house in the middle, in that middle space. You know the one that you always take so your kids can't beat you? That's a good strategy right there, by the way. Put your house in the middle. Now write the initials of your neighbors around you. Oh, no. Did he just say that? Yes, I did. Why don't you stop worrying about the lost people at the homeless shelter as your first preoccupation? As good as that is, hear me clearly, and start worrying about the people you have, that you have next door to you in your neighborhood. Talk to them. Love them. Serve them. And out of the overflow of that, your pastors in here and your leaders will help channel your residual bandwidth because we don't want you to overextend because you will sacrifice your inner man development, and you'll sacrifice your family's development so you can be about church business. Don't do that. That's not an excuse for you not to be involved in church. You should be involved in church, but in an appropriate manner. And our pastors must model that. And from what I see, I think that he is. I think that he is. So, intimacy with God. Oftentimes people say, well, how can I become more intimate with God? This is a, just a simple illustration. If, I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's a blank rectangle right here. This is all human beings. Okay? All of us who bear the imago Dei, the image of God, who long for him on some level, but hate him at the same time. Talk about conflicted, right? That's where we all live. Until God's Spirit changes our mind, and we, as an act of our volition, call upon the name of the Lord and are saved. Unless he initiated in your heart, you would have never chose Jesus at all. So get off your high horse and love your neighbor who doesn't yet know him, but who is longing and conflicted and hurting. Well, how do we come to know Jesus? Well, I think I heard Pastor Moses talk about uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God even today. It's the precepts of God. That's the entry level. And some of us camp out here in our Christian life, and we never move beyond that. My dear friend, you must know the Word of God. I will, I've never met anyone who's mature in their faith who doesn't regularly spend time in the Scripture. Did everybody just hear me say that? Okay? This is not heresy. This is trajectory. Pre-Christian, coming into the body of Christ, learning the precepts, which are sweet as honeycomb, David says. They're not burdensome. They bring freedom. It's for freedom that we've been set free. Amen? That's why this can never be a place that demands people to do stuff the Bible says doesn't say anything about. Or vice versa. But as you learn the precepts of God, you, become, you come face to face with your need for His strength to live out your calling. And this is where prayer becomes more important. I love how this church prioritizes prayer. If your prayer life is stagnant and just not very fulfilling, can I make a confession here? That was my experience for many years, even as a clergy person. So you're not alone. Prayer is dialogical. It's a conversation with God. May I suggest rather than yakking at him and then walking away unfulfilled, instead you sit down in his presence and ask him to speak to you. Read his scripture and say, Father, speak to me. What is it you want to talk to me about? What do you want to share with me today? And then capture those things and then prayerfully consider them. It could be the voice of God speaking to you. And you grow in hearing. Prayer. 
And then as you begin to grow in your life of prayer and your intimacy with God deepens, and this is the trajectory of my life here. I'm talking about my own experience. And as I see it in the Gospels, his presence becomes vitally critical to your daily life. Now we know, Pastor Moses and I were actually just talking about this, that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, right? That's what the Bible teaches us. But there's something special that happens when his manifest presence is sought and breaks out. It's where your heart longs to be. And when you taste it, you want more of it. And when you depart from it, you long for it again, and you circle back around. Because that becomes the passion of your heart. Okay? The evil one wants to interrupt all of this. This is the seed ground of additional spiritual warfare. So let's go to the scriptures even right now in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, which is where we're going to focus. Okay? And in the interest of time, I've got to move on here. I just really felt you guys needed to hear that, so that would set the stage for everything we're going to learn. Okay? Now, does the date October 7th, 2001 mean anything to anybody here tonight? A couple people. What happened? That's in September. Uh, neighborhood, though. That's when our country went to war. 6,180 days ago. And we've been embroiled in wars ever since. Listen, y'all, you are embroiled in a war every day of your life. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy who wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy your joy, and he wants to kill every opportunity that you have to enter into the destiny that Jesus has purchased for you. That's his plan. And unless you know his plan and how to resist his plan, you aren't going to win this war. Now, Jesus has positionally won it for us, we know that, that happened at the cross, but we need to understand that practically we have to lean into the weapons of our warfare. So uh, we cling to the fact that Jesus has a plan for our lives. Many of us love to quote Jeremiah 29, 9. Maybe you have that in your home, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. But listen, as one who knows, unless you are fully prepared to go to the battlefield when you get out of the Amtrak or the Humvee or the Hilo or whatever it is, you are going to be ineffective on the battlefield. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now, based on what the Scripture teaches, that God has given you everything you need to resist. This is where people stop the conversation. Like, we're constantly, perpetually on the defensive. Listen, you don't, want, you don't win wars by constantly being on the defensive. Did you know that? You've got to take ground. One of the great joys of my life is to play paintball with young boys. And I light them up with my paintball gun, smoke them all. It's a true confession, I'm sorry. It just gives me a lot of joy. And you know how that happens? Because they cower down behind the barricades, and I attack. That's what we have to do. We have to attack. But the only way that you can attack is if you've been resourced and fortified and trained to do so. So as Pastor Moses and I were prayerfully talking about what this was going to look like, I mean, there was a little trepidation on his part. Wouldn't you say that, Pastor Moses? Because when we tell the devil that we're going to take this thing seriously, you know, you ever see boys do that, put their chests out, like up some bantam roosters? When you put your chest out, and say, I'm coming after you. I'm not going to let you have my joy. I'm not going to let you have my family. I'm not going to let you cause division and discord in my church. Be prepared, because whenever there's a breakout of God's spirit, there's a spiritual counterattack by the forces of evil. Now, that doesn't mean you should cower in fear, because Jesus has won the victory. Luther called Satan God's junkyard dog. Have you ever seen a junkyard dog? Oftentimes they're on a chain, and they can only go as far as they're staked out. And that's his limit in your life, as far as he's staked out. 
And here's the thing. I like to get sweet revenge on the evil one because I know when God gives me blessing, I receive it as such. But when adversity comes and Father sifts it through his hands and permits it to come, sends it, whatever your vocabulary is, it's all the same thing. This is semantics. The scripture tells us that God's going to use it for my benefit. That doesn't mean he's going to deliver me from it. But as I read the scripture, I'm, I get verses like this. Comfort others with the comfort you yourself have been given. Your brokenness, your divorce, your child going astray, losing your job, losing your life, whatever. There's people out there who need you because they're going through the same exact thing. One of the things I'm famous for, my wife teases me about it all the time, but I don't care, I'm going to say it anyways. You ready? Here we go. Some of you wives are cringing because you have this experience with your husband. Uh, everyone around you, and you probably should write this down, everybody around you is operating at an encouragement deficit. Everyone in your life is operating at an encouragement deficit. And the gas tank of their inner man is bordering on empty all the time. People are running on fumes. They're being crushed and criticized and condemned at every turn, sadly, even by people in the church. So instead of saying the hard word, say the kind word. Even if a rebuke has to be given, do it kindly and biblically as a shepherd. Because you're all shepherding somebody, right? In some way, shape, or form, even if it's in your own home. The struggle is real. So let's see what the scripture has to say here about this as we move on. Our world around us is exi exists in a perpetual state of war, at least for the last 6,000 plus days. But spiritually speaking, so do we. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 4 says this, Though we walk in the flesh, are you following along with me, church? We are not waging war according to the flesh. Listen, when somebody is harsh to you or mean to you or purposely tries to destroy you, see it for what it is. That person's being animated by their fear, jealousy, anger, which is being stoked by the forces of evil that's trying to destroy them and destroy you too. Don't do the devil's work for him. See the imago day in them and return kindness for curses. That's why Jesus said that, right? A soft answer turns away wrath, it says in the Proverbs. You will have combat as long as you draw breath. Sometimes I think as Christians, we, we think that if we just get over this hump, we're going to enter into a season of ease. Can I, can I just help you with that for a second? No, you won't. You're going to come out of the valley. You're going to ascend the mountain of the Lord. I love that, Pastor. And he's going to take you down the other side. This is how kind he is. He takes you back down into the valley. Why? So you can learn more, and you can care more, and you can rescue more. I'm not nearly as pugnacious now in my 40s as I was in my 20s. That might be hard for some of you to believe. You should have seen me then. Particularly with chemical additives. This combat is against the worldly system, the flesh, and the devil. That's, that's who your enemies are. Write that down. That's what the Bible teaches us. The world's, worldly system is all of those things that are constantly trying to influence us through the media. Your own flesh is doing battle against you. Your lusts, your pride, your ungodly desires. That's why Paul says, I don't do the things that I want to do, and I do the things I don't want to do. You're in a struggle with your flesh, and only the Spirit can provide victory. Only the Spirit. And then your enemy, the devil. Now, how do you win a war, friends? You know how, how to win a war? How, how have we won the wars that we've won recently? I'll tell you, by two, there's, there's two things that are prere prerequisite here to win a war. Overwhelming force and greater firepower. So when we take the field as Marines, we're going to bring everything that we have with as many boys as we can and obliterate you. So God has given us weapons to obliterate the works of the devil. 
Are you ready? Let's go over to uh, Ephesians chapter 6 now. What are those weapons? Well, some of you have maybe learned these in Bible school, had a little, or a Sunday school, and uh, learned little ditties, right? Um, not only, you know, the, the point here was that our world exists in a perpetual state of war, and our weapons are spiritually superior to our enemy's arsenal. That's the second point. Here's what the scripture says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Underline that. You're not fighting against people. But against the rulers, the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places whose manipulation show up in physical places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Put a circle or a box around truth. That's your first weapon. Tell the truth. Live in the truth. You're supposed to be following the one who's called the way, the truth, and the life. Right in John's Gospel? Don't spin don't dissemble. Don't leave out part of the truth. Live in the truth and then you don't have to be afraid of what other people may say. And that's a word we all need to hear because we're always in spin mode. We want people to think the, the best of us all the time because we're aware of how broken we really are. Listen, you're broken. And so am I. But Jesus is putting our pieces back together. Amen? And you need me and I need you as difficult as it is. Oftentimes people leave the church community because how difficult it is to live in community. Has anybody ever been there? You don't have to raise your hands. Maybe you left your last church because of how difficult it was to live in community. Listen, as difficult as it is to live in community, it's harder still to live by yourself. Trying to do this Jesus thing. You weren't designed for it. Now here's another one of the enemy's schemes. He loves to get people alone. Anybody hear this? You suck. God can't use you. Kill yourself. Now, nobody admits to that in open sessions, but I've heard it. You need someone to be in the foxhole with you. There's a reason why Navy SEALs, who aren't as good as they're cracked up to be, can I just say that from the top pulpit here? Hollywood. Send in the Marines. <laughs> there is a classified mission. I can't tell you about it, but the Marines had to go in and rescue the SEALs. You can write that down, too. Huh. Do some research on Google. You'll find it. Just be careful, because the government might be watching. There's a reason why the Navy SEALs have swim buddies. And there's a reason why Marines have battle buddies. Because you will be killed if you go out into the field by yourself. There is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christianity. You will be killed. If you're tempted here tonight because of how angry you are, disappointed, or you, maybe you're coming off of that, get into community with people who love you and who will care for you, and people who inhabit this church, listen to me. I think you do a good job of this, but nobody, I mean all of us can stand to do a better job. This needs to be a safe place for people to disclose their dirt and to be welcomed in, whether they're a drunk or they've had an abortion or whatever it is. This is the place where the healing mercy of Jesus is found. Amen. The breastplate of righteousness, right? What is righteousness? It means living your life in the correct way. What is the correct way? Live your life the way the master did. It's a, it's a game of Simon Says. <laughs> Copy him. You know, my, my son does that periodically. He's 11, but he still does that because he knows he tw it tweaks me. I'll say something, he'll say it right back to me. Right? Whatever Jesus has said, you say that. Whatever Jesus does, you do that. If you don't know what that looks like, read the Gospels. The Gospels are for the church. I had somebody tell me the Gospels aren't for the church, only Paul's letters. I went, are you kidding me? Where did you get that? You want to look like Jesus? 
Look at what Jesus looked like. And follow in his footsteps. Now, I don't know what you know about ancient Jewish culture, but you had to candidate to be the disciple of a rabbi. And they only took the cream of the crop. The top 3%. And you know what? Jesus came looking for the bottom 3%. And they didn't have to candidate for him. He went looking for them. That's what he's done for you. That's what he did for an Irish wild man a number of years ago. He came looking for me. Because once he set his affection on you, he's like a I mean, that's why I call it the father papa. Because that's the kind of papa I try to be. Imperfectly. Peace. In a world that's devoid of it, God's people need to rest in the peace that we have. The shalom that he's given us. Do you know what that word shalom means? Right? Do you know what it, that, the translation of that means? It's not just that active hostility with God is over. I hear people preach that. It means the fullness of the Christ life is given to us. Blessing. Warfare is over. Adopted into his family. Blessing ensues. Rest. Receive his rest. Can I just say that over you tonight? Receive his rest. If you're too busy to rest, you're too busy. Rest your body. Rest your spirit. Rest on the bosom of the Father. Hear his heartbeat for you. And then operate missionally from that place, not to get to that place. I have a friend of mine who says rest is a weapon. Stop and think about that. Rest is a weapon. You want to get sweet revenge on the evil one? Rest. You want to care for your bride? Rest. Listen, if I can sit on the, tel- the, the couch and keep my body from vibrating and moving around doing chores to watch a bonnet movie with her, so can you, fellas. Listen, come talk to me afterwards. I'll pray for you. The helmet... Excuse me, the shield of faith. Brian jo- Dr. Brian Johnson in his uh, translation, the Passion Translation of the Scripture I picked up recently, uh, points out to us that this is an allusion back to Psalm 91. And the poetic imagery there speaks about God's wraparound protection of us. So when you and I think about a shield, we're thinking about something that's going to take the hit from in front, right? Well, God's shield... It, it, it's all around you, you all. It reminds me of the prayer of St. Patrick. Ha <laughs> ha, I got to work that in, I love it. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Christ above me, Christ below me, Christ beside me. What is he saying? God's wraparound protection is with me all of the time. There's nothing I have to fear. You don't have to fear the devil. You don't have to fear the adversary. You don't have to fear his schemes. Because wherever you go, God's spirit is and the kingdom's advancing. Can I get an amen out there? The helmet of salvation. He saved you. He's cared for you. He's done for you what you can't do for yourself. And you need to remind yourself of that. I have a friend who says we have to rehearse the gospel to ourselves daily. And that's really true. What has God done for us in the gospel? And then lastly, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You need to know the Scriptures. The Scripture puts the evil one to rout. That's what Jesus did when he was tempted, right? He quoted the Scripture to him. And the evil one knows the Scripture, and he'll twist it to try to dissuade you or distract you or blind you. You need to know it so you'll be able to stand strong on the day of attack, on the day of temptation. That's why we've we've got a whole generation of kids and young people. When I say young people, I mean people younger than me. It's really terrible that I'm in my middle years now. It's bothering me tremendously, but anyways, somebody needs to pray for me about that afterwards. Lots of people who've grown up in the church don't know the Word of God. Why? Why? because we've made it about clergy and professionals. And what I'm doing is saying to you all tonight, in the name of Jesus, you are able to walk in his word and with power. 
to disciple your children and grandchildren to be the arms and feet of Jesus. One of the reasons why we had a reformation, for those of you who aren't church historians, is to restore the priesthood of all believers. Can I get an amen in here? Listen, if this rested on me and Pastor Moses, we might as well give it up right now and go down to the bar and have a couple of shots. And then I start dancing, guaranteed. It's for all of us. There's a, it's a gift from God. It's for all of us. Be empowered in Jesus' name. Your shepherd, as wonderful as he is, you can't ride into heaven on his coattails. And you can't do mission on his coattails either. So when he calls the church to arms, and he says, boys, ladies, time to platoon up because we're going to attack the evil one today in this way. Go with him. Listen, remember, remember, King Jesus has a guide on. Does anybody know what a guide on is? Anybody here in the military? What is it, y'all? It's the flag. It's got your identity on it. My young Marines that I am the unit commander for, we have a guide on. It's got their identity imprinted on it. And your identity is imprinted on Jesus' guide on, which the scriptures say what? What's on that? What word? Love. You are loved by God fully. Some of you here, here tonight need to hear this, what I'm about to say. God doesn't love you more when you perform well. That's how I grew up. I felt like the only time I was going to get the full measure of the love that I craved was if I did well. God loves you whether you obey or disobey. It's changeless. Now again, that's not to say do whatever you want because if God's love for you is real in your life, you know what you're going to want to do? You're going to want to love him well in return. It's really that simple. And you can try to argue with me all you want, but you're wrong. I can say that pretty confidently here because I've got about 800 scriptures that kind of back me up. You bring yours, I'll bring mine, we'll wrestle, uh, and then you're going to cry uncle. <laughs> Look at the commands in here. Be strong. Church, be strong. Be encouraged. God is at work in you. These weapons, we've talked about how we can't wage a defensive war, but we've got to go on the offense because we've got superior firepower and overwhelming force because King Jesus has gone over the lip of the trench and he's running full tilt up the mountain, storming the gates of hell, rescuing people right and left. And I don't know about you, but I can't sit in the pew while he's doing that. I got to get up over there with him because that's where the joy is. That's where the peace is. That's where the purpose is. Don't let your purpose be found in any lesser thing. Be alert, be alert and be vigilant is what the apostle says here. The Old Testament phrases it this way, gird up your loins and act like a man. That one doesn't translate too well in contemporary English. I have an Episcopal friend of mine. Uh, he used to work with a youth, and he was hysterical. So one day we're together, uh, and a group of people, too, and his wife was mortified when he did this. So he quoted the verse to him, and he pulled his shorts up so they looked like a, like a loincloth. I mean, everything was decent, but she was like, Wally, I can't believe you did that, you know? Gird up your loins, put on your armor, and get about it. Get after it. What is your arsenal? Here are your weapons. You ready? Copy these down. The scripture. We talked about that. I don't need to belabor that, do I? The scripture is powerful. It destroys darkness at every turn. You have to speak it out loud. Speak it out loud. It, it provides us with ammo, with prophetic promises to deal death blows to deception. How's that for alliteration? I grew up as a Baptist. Prophetic ammunition, or excuse me, ammo of prophetic promise to deal death blows to deception. Paul says also here to persist in prayer. Prayer is a weapon. I've already told you that rest is a weapon too, so make sure you get that one. Prayer is a weapon. It is the means of accessing 
all of the provision of God that you need to do what it is that He's called you to do. And the reason why our church is in decline here in the United States is because we're fat and dumb and happy with our wealth, with our jobs, with our movie theaters, game systems, whatever. Why is God's Spirit doing an incredible work in the two-thirds world right now? It's because they have nothing else, and they're, and they're desperate for God. And they cry out for Him, and they expect miracles, and they see them. They see them. And that comment was not a, a, a ding on anybody who's carrying around any few, a few extra pounds. Believe me, I am. Okay? Don't listen to that, that whisper. Worship. Worship is another weapon. You know what worship does? It disrupts and dissipates the fog of war. When I counsel people, guys, pastors, who struggle with porn, who struggle with rage, struggle with whatever, the only thing that I have found in all of these years that is always successful, it's not memorizing more verses, it's not going to more church services, it's not more hours of counseling. Though all of those things help, it's worship. Worship. When you are in the midst of temptation and the throw of the adversary to turn that computer on and go to that website that your wife doesn't know that you access, turn God's music on and get on your face and ask Him for help. Or raise your hands. Do what you need to do. I was in Orlando ministering this week and I heard the pastor from Red Rocks Church in Colorado say, it's time for the church to put its foot down and its hands up. Because when your hands, when you put your foot down, you're saying, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I'm incapable of doing it on my own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch forth my hands to heaven. Listen, I grew up as a Baptist and I was a Presbyterian minister for many years. So if I can do it, so can you. Raise your hand up to heaven like a child and ask your Papa for what only He can give. And He delights to deliver a knockout punch to the schemes of the evil one and the assignments of the adversary. And they will crumble at the name of Jesus. Because the name of Jesus has power. I feel strongly about that. Did you pick up on it? I have an Episcopal priest friend of mine who said, sometimes I can't do anything when I pray but say the name of Jesus. 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 When I'm hyperventilating and I feel like I'm having an anxiety attack and I'm in the thick of some spiritual warfare, all I can say is Jesus. Have you ever been there? I have felt like I was going to be swept under by evil and all of the fear and the anxiety and the lies, like I was drowning and going under the water in the ocean where I grew up. And there's been times all I could say is, Jesus, the ancient cry of the church, the first prayer, of, if you will, was, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. But if you're in Christ tonight, you're a saint. Stop looking at yourself at who you were and instead fix your eyes on Jesus and remember who you are. You're not a sinner any longer. You're a saint who struggles with sin. Did you catch that? Sinner is the language of those outside the covenant, outside of God's grace, outside of God's love. You are desperately loved by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I know there's some texts in the New Testament where Paul calls himself a sinner. We can talk about that. But you, this is the first rule of biblical criticism. Are you ready? You, you interpret the unclear in light of the preponderance of the clear. Stop going back to old wells that are filled with poison that the evil one is trying to use to kill you. And instead, fix your eyes heavenward. Remember who you are. You know what your identity is tonight? Here's a word of identity for some of you who are struggling. Somebody needs to hear this, what the Father's telling me right now. Identity is this. Your identity is not what you do. It's not what sports you play. First and foremost, your identity is beloved son or daughter of the king. 
That's who you are. So even if nobody else thinks you're worth a bucket of spit, God has called you his beloved. And you need to purchase some worship music that's going to rehearse that with you. And I've got plenty, and I know Moses loves music like I do, and he'll hook you up too, right, brother? Beloved child of God. When the Father said over Jesus at his baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased because you are in Christ and he is your older brother, he's speaking that word over you. Dear, adopted into the family of God. And that's not a pious platitude or an old chorus that Bill Gaither wrote. As wonderful as that is, we used to sing it at communion all the time. That was the kind of church I grew up in. I loved it. Anybody in here adopted? My son is. I chose him for myself. I went down to the courthouse after paying an exorbitant amount of extortion money to take him out of the system. And one of the proudest days of my life is when I held him in my arms and they read his name, which was no longer what it was. It was Zayden Matthew Bellier. Matthew is gift of God. You are a gift that God has given himself. Did you catch that? He has adopted you into his family and he delights in you. And all of the inheritance rights of Jesus are now yours because of what Jesus has done. That's what happened at the cross. You want to talk about a knockout blow to the schemes of evil? There it is. There it is. What about authority? Do you have authority to resist the devil? Jesus has given you authority to do that. To rebuke evil. To stand against it. To vanquish it. My peace I leave you. I've given you the keys of the kingdom. You will do greater things yet. What do these verses mean? You have authority delegated to you by Jesus to do the work of the Father, not your own will. You have authority. Stand in it. You have a credential. Zayden gets to go places with me that other people don't get a, place, don't get a chance to go to. You know why? Because he's my son. And he rides my coattails. And you're riding Jesus's. Expect God to do great things. Expectancy. That's another weapon. Authority. That was the worship, authority, faith. Expectant faith. Expect great things from God. Could it be that we don't see miracles as often as our hearts long for? Because we don't expect them? What would happen if we started expecting God to show up in this worship service and see people healed and delivered and all kinds of things? It happens. I've seen it with my own eyes. God doesn't do that stuff anymore, right? Wrong answer. I'll take you on a trip with me if you believe that. And you will be blown away by what happens when God's people expect him to show up. Adoniram Judson, great missionary, said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Do you believe that tonight? Righteous living. That's another white weapon. Righteous living. Holiness, right? Now, when I talk about holiness, I'm not talking about whether you chew tobacco or drink brown beer or go to the movies or none of the above. What is holiness in the scripture? Do you know? It's taking on more of the character of God. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. Holiness is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's taking on more of the character of Jesus. And the last time I looked in the Gospels, I saw him demonstrating love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, you know all that stuff that's the fruit of the Spirit? That Spirit lives in you. That's what it looks like to live righteously, correctly, caring for other human beings so that they might come to know Jesus as their Savior. 
I think we're going to end there. I'm just feeling like that's where, that's where we need to stop tonight. So what I'm going to do is invite uh, the, the team to come forward and to pray. And what we do at my church is anytime there's preaching, anytime there's worshiping, it always, God calls for our response. Okay? Some of us came up in a tradition where there was an altar call every week. That's kind of like what I'm talking about, but not really. If you don't know Jesus tonight, if you haven't come to the place where you've come to the end of yourself and said yes to Christ, come forward and receive prayer. I'm going to have some friends up here after the music begins to play. Come forward and receive Christ. If you need healing in any way, in your body, physically, I'm going to pray and ask God with expectancy that he heals you here tonight. If you need your mind healed because of what you've done or what somebody has done to you, come forward. I'm going to pray for healing for you. If you are afflicted with those voices that we were talking about, you come forward. We're going to pray for you, believing that God's going to give you victory. If you need to embrace your identity, if you need to step into leadership because God's been speaking to your heart about that, you need to come forward as well. Let this be an Ebenezer moment for you in your life where you say yes to God in ways in which would have made you uncomfortable before because of the work of the Spirit in you. I will pray for every single person who comes forward until I am here till midnight if I need to. And I think Pastor Moses is going to dismiss us after the music. But linger. If you need prayer, there's going to be five or six of us here. We want to pray for you. We want to see you get healed. We want to see your gifts get activated. We want to see an impartation of God's grace in your life. And for those of you who are just kind of chewing on this, there's no pressure to stay. There's no pressure to come forward. You got to scoot out, you do that. Okay? We've got kids in the back. We're sensitive to that. We're going to be here. So you come as God's Spirit leads you. Pastor Foy has mentioned, if you would like to be prayed for, prayed with, you come forward and he'll pray with you. But as I mentioned earlier, we're here to ascend the mountain of the Lord and you walking forward right now, that's part of that. It might mean that you just want to stay right where you are and just sing praises to him. We're going to give you the opportunity to do that now as well. I think that any time you go to church, any time, no matter when it is, what, what church it is, it doesn't matter. God always wants a response from all of us. And I don't know what that response looks like. I want you to respond to what you've heard. Whatever the Spirit has worked inside of you tonight, respond to that. If He's called you to salvation, respond by saying yes to Jesus. If he's called you to a more passionate walk with him and you've been lethargic and complacent, maybe tonight's the night you just want to step forward, maybe not to be prayed for, but just to walk forward as a, as a sign to just say, God, I'm no longer on the fence. I'm no longer that lukewarm guy, that lukewarm girl. I want to be, I want to get after you. I want to worship you with all my mind, heart, soul, and strength. I want to love people, Jesus, the way you loved people. Stop talking about it in church. Stop talking about it around the dinner table, but start living it. Maybe that's what you need to do right now. Maybe we need to just, right where you are, just repent of your unwillingness to give in to his spirit and his word and to start to live out the life that he's called you to live. So whatever it is that you need to do, please, I ask you, don't leave this place before you get that done.